You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And today we're here with Mike Schultz. Mike is president of Rain Group and also of the Rain Group Center for Sales Research. He's also the best-selling author of Insight Selling and Remaking Conversations. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you on today. I, your full bio will be in the show notes here. I want to jump in and talk a little bit about your experience in selling and particularly your experience in selling services. But the place I always like to start is to give people a sense of your background. How did you get to where you are today? What's been, uh, tell me a little bit about your background, a little bit about Rain Group, and um, then we can get into some of the questions. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's see my background. It all started when I was five and I read In Search of Excellence. Just kidding. So um, <laughs> I pot luck. I, I ended up in selling pot luck. I thought I was smart coming out of uh, a nice undergraduate school and I wanted to have the word consultant on my business card. Yeah. So I applied to consulting firms. The firm that I ended up landing with when I was 22 years old was a sales performance consulting firm. So I was analyzing sales process and strategy at midsize and large companies at age 22. Great. I ended up after about six months, and this is part of the pot luck story, mm-hmm. after about six months of strategizing about sales with more senior guys who, you know, I was the, the young smart whippersnapper who could do their work for them. Yep. I said to the CEO of the company, it was a small consulting firm, I feel like I've been reading about skiing for six months and I've never put on skis. <laughs> so do you, mind the if, snow. <laughs> yeah, do you mind if I pick up the phone and write some letters at the times it was letters and phone, call, call, mail, mail, call, call. Amazing, good. And, and try to get some meetings and try and join you in selling. Yeah, sure. So I ended up, they ended up firing the director of sales because I was outpacing them with generating meetings. <laughs> uh, that wasn't a pretty situation at a young age. So it was a sales process and strategy. Then yeah. I took over a division of a consulting firm Mm -hmm. where at a young age I had six full-time and 30 dotted line sellers to me and it was all for a professional service so I did that for for years and then I started my own firm so at 27 I had a business partner who was 22 years my senior he's still my partner today Um, and we had to go sell ourselves so we not only did we do sales training because it was a part of our our collective backgrounds but we also had to go off and sell. And I thought, he's the almost 50-year-old guy. He's the one that's going to be credible, that's been a CEO <laughs> and run a $50 million business and been a senior vice president of sales. And I'll probably be in the background. And we ended up that I sold just as much just as much as he did. Yeah. So, so and, here we are today. Yeah. So what are, the, what are some of the challenges? I mean, I guess, you know, we're talking about selling services. And I think services has some particularities. Uh, it's very different than selling widgets. But from your point of view, like how do you see – Or what are the big issues around selling services as a a thing you're out there in the market trying to pitch? What are the challenges for you? Well, I mean, the obvious one is the intangible. I can demo the technology. I can't demo my awesome audit. Uh, I can (laughs) I can walk people through a product and you can do the kinds of product comparisons. But if I am selling technology services or if I'm an engineering firm, I look good in a suit. He looks good in a suit. We're all kind of articulate. The PowerPoints look okay. It's hard to differentiate when you can't see it, touch it, feel it, that sort of intangible nature. It's also harder to sell an intangible because you have have to be the storyteller behind it and that's how it comes across it doesn't yeah. come across because i give you a 30-day trial uh, yeah. that's not going to work if i'm capping a brownfield that oh, will try it for we'll try it for 30 days if you don't like it send it back oh it doesn't <laughs> quite work like that you don't like it by the time we get to the foundation if you don't like it you don't have to put up the framing it's okay yeah. so it doesn't happen yeah the other big challenge i'm going to talk about for selling services is less about the dynamics of selling services and more about the emotional problems and challenges Mm, that service people have with selling services. The biggest thing that is in the way of selling services are the people selling the services and what they think selling is and how they approach their time and day and that they care about selling. They're the first ones to say at a meeting, well, I'm a XYZ kind of professional services provider. I'm not a salesperson. The second you say that, you shoot yourself in the foot because you believe it. You believe you're not good at it. You don't try to get good at it. You don't focus on it. You don't embrace it. You're not proud of it. You're not trying to figure out how to do it well. So the sellers of services have to get out of their own way. And if they can do that, they can tend to sell a ton more. Yeah. You know, that kind of mindset and the kind of the story that you're telling yourself, you know, comes up 
and, and a lot of parts of business and performance, you know, in, in many ways. But I think it's really, really critical in, in sales. I mean, it's just how you show up in that sales conversation is, is probably the, the biggest factor in terms of the, the likelihood of outcomes or, or desirable outcomes. What, so what are the, um, what are the typical, uh, I guess, mindsets that you see people kind of starting with that are not so positive? Or, or tell me about sort of the, the, the starting point that you typically see and then where do you work with people to kind of move them away from that? The first one is probably I don't like selling. Mm. I don't want to sell. I'm not good at it. I can't position myself. I can sell something else. Yeah. But selling myself, it's just, it's just all, all the emotional stuff. Yeah. And then it's the I'm too busy to sell. I have clients. I have other other priorities. Well, you can focus on your other priorities. And if you're happy making what you make and doing what you do, and it's good enough to not sell to stay steady, then have a blast. But if you want to scale up your service business, yeah. you're, you're going to do that through selling. Uh, when, when we started our business, much like you, we focused exclusively on service businesses. Mm -hmm. So we were marketing and sales consultants for service businesses. And we would do, and we, we were tactic neutral, as in we weren't selling okay. PR. Yeah. If you buy growth from a PR firm, the answer is PR. And if you buy yeah. it from SEO, it's SEO. Yeah. So we were tactic neutral. And we would come up and do the analysis. And we would say, like, you can work on your website here. You can work on your, your, your messaging here. You can work on these kinds of events here. But the fundamental problem is, is that you four have been selling for 15 years here, yeah. and now you have a 100-person firm. You have about 30 people who are about your age and mm -hmm. about your level when you started this firm, and you haven't asked one of them to sell, exactly. and they're not. And if you could literally just get 10 of them to sell a quarter of what you do, you will double the size yeah. of the firm. Yeah. So the, the, the lever to pull was typically through the people. And they had reared them in such a way that selling was a bad word and you don't want to do it. They never taught them. And now they're 47 years old and they haven't even tried it. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, that situation is so common, uh, you know, and it, and it really is a ceiling, I think, ultimately for a lot of services companies where, you know, the, the growth of the company ends up being constrained or constricted by the ability of that senior person or that senior team to sell. And they really haven't created any kind of system and any kind of process of actually creating more salespeople, not just selling strategy and selling process but actually training people to actually sell. Yeah, and at a service firm, sometimes it's the salesperson, there's a, a BD person, but it's usually through the strength of the professionals themselves and what they do. Just you know, huge untapped opportunity across existing accounts for cross-sell, upsell, just building practices. They, they, they just don't even know what to do. Yeah. They, 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 don't, they don't know what to do. It's, it's, the big challenge is not about the service itself. It's about the people and your strategy and your ability to put one together and then execute against it over the long term, you should be fine. Yeah. So now th there's a couple of different kind of types of services businesses, but do you see differences in, or I'm kind of curious on what types of service businesses you've worked with, if you see differences in them, either in terms of the industry or in terms of models, and are there different approaches to selling in those situations? Mm -hmm. Or do you, is it really, it kind of doesn't matter. They're all, that you, you have the same basic model that maybe gets tweaked. Tell me a little bit about the different types of services and how you approach them. Yeah, certain things don't matter and certain things do matter. Have we worked with all four of the big four plus accounting firms with 10 and 15, 100 and 500 people? We've worked with uh, multiple AMLA 100 firms and as well your 50 person law firm and your 10 person law firm. We have, uh, we actually had a program how to sell uh, architecture, engineering and consult and, and construction. So we had one specifically focused on AEC. We work with large global engineering firms and also, you know, 20 people at a, a regional firm. Yep. Management consulting is different than technology services. So there are certain things in the dynamics. Uh, if you sell a service that has a 75 mile radius, you're gonna be doing a lot more networking, a lot more knowing the financial guys, a lot yep. more knowing just all of the people in your circles of influence. But take a business like ours, we had more of a local component a long, long time ago, but we went from how service businesses start, two guys, two laptops, the kitchen table and the dog, and we now have our headquarters is in Boston, and we have offices in Geneva, London, Mumbai, Sydney, Johannesburg, Toronto, and Bogota. So I don't need to go to a local networking event because our calls come from major cities, and it's not just I need to know people. So do you market locally? Do you market more nationally or globally? So there are certain nuances there. The things that actually are the same are to ask the question, what do we need to do to activate the people here for selling? You have to ask that question. Same question. The nuances might be different. Yeah. 
And a lot of the dynamics are, that we talked about before are the same. They don't want to sell and I'm not good at it. And a few people are naturals and some are never going to do it. But there's a bell curve in the middle that can. Other things that are, are similar is how to lead a great sales conversation. Yeah. Those dynamics don't really change that much across industries. How to grow your accounts. Oh, we are a diversified management consulting firm and we bought other firms and we have services across five different areas and they only buy this from us. Mm. We work with one of the largest yeah. recruiting firms. They had bought a large leadership firm. They had bought a psychographic assessments company. They bought a couple yeah. of other firms, but they all sold their own things. Yeah. Asking the question and approaching how do we grow our accounts is the same question. The individual strategies for accounts are going to be different. The questions are, are the questions are the same. So the frame, kind of the framework is the same, and as you apply it to the different situations, is where you have to kind of make the adjustments and the tweaks to to how you actually do it. Yeah, let me give you an example. Yeah, so that'd be great. most services firms, when they come to us, let's just pick accounting. We're okay doing tax and audit, uh, but we have consulting services that nobody brings up. We have. We have technology services that nobody brings up. We have risk management that nobody brings up. Selling these, what they would call value add services, mm. a huge untapped opportunity that people want to tap. And certain things just kind of come in and are repeat business. Well, it's the same kind of dynamic to be able to get them to go from reactive to proactive, yep. to get them to understand that. It's not just about if, if somebody calls and says, let's say you called me and I'm an accountant and yep. you said, we're looking to switch accounting firms. And I have you come into the office. My first question should be, what brings you in? What are you trying to sort out? Yeah. What's going on with your accounting that you're not getting that you should yeah. be getting? So I'm, I'm asking those questions and doing the needs discovery. And then I can go a certain amount deeper. But let's say I'm selling something proactive. We can walk into companies, and if we have a company that we can analyze that's over $100 million in this industry, we can usually save them $3 million in their bottom line, and we actually share blah, blah, blah. And I want to set up a meeting to talk to you about our cost reduction services that have you know, had such explosive results in other places. Yeah. If I walk in and say, so what brings you in, and what's, what are your needs in this area? They're going to say... I don't know. You set up this yeah, meeting. Exactly. What is it that you have to pay? Yeah. It's just a very different dynamic. That's kind of the inbound, outbound lead. Like yeah. If, yeah. Or yeah. even just react, reactive to proactive, yeah. for sure. And they only understand the reactive, and they start shaking in their boots when they have to actually start, and yeah, I'll use the word, pitching something. Yeah. You still have to listen. You still have to ask questions. But the dynamic of how you actually run that discussion, it's just a different flow. Yeah. And they don't know how to do that. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to the mindset stuff, too. It's like I can I can if someone's coming to me with a problem, I can help them solve it. But I can't actually go out and identify problems mm -hmm. that are out there or even help people understand the problems they may not even see and figure out how to sell against mm -hmm. those. Those are those are very different approaches. For sure. So how um, so give me some give me some tools or give me some sense of framework. So how how do you advise or how do you help people with with those conversations, with that process? What are some of the key kind of structural elements, milestones in the conversation? How do you how do you approach that? Mm -hmm. Well, the first part, if we're talking about service businesses, the, the kind of work that that you do is absolutely essential. And we do similar kinds of things to help them understand what is my growth strategy? Do I want to do this? And can I look at with open eyes what needs to happen to get there? And we, we have worked with service businesses to do analysis on their growth. And we said, you're growing at 6%. You could definitely grow double digits. You could grow 20% of the year. If you just did these things, activated this, and you have this great company that you bought or the service that you have that literally just if more people brought it up and brought it out, you'd have a lot of growth. And it's going to require doing things like this. We've had some companies grab that and run with it and double the size of their service businesses. And we've had others that say like, yeah, 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 we want to do it. And we're like, ah, it doesn't sound like you really want to do it. Are you willing to change? Yeah. You know, so if the, um, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? You know this one? <laughs> one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. The light bulb has to want to change. So it's all this mental stuff. But then you have to set up the structure. The structure. Yeah. Uh, so at Rain Group in 2011, we're a service business and we – actually made a decision. Are we going to go for scale or are we going to keep it small, have nice lives, collect the extra cash and go 10 or 20 years yeah. and just have our little business? And yeah. we decided to have scale. And we set up a five-year plan. We locked off two thirds of our services. We started investing, angel investing our own money. Now we're at the tune of about four or $5 million invested in certain technologies, platforms, product, 
marketing so we could actually go and have growth. And so we set up this platform so we can, we, you know, we can shoot up like this. Because if we didn't do that in our industry, then we wouldn't be taking advantage of the, the structural changes in the industry and how everything was moving. If we just said, yeah, let's just pick up the phone more, yeah, we, there's certain things you need to do to actually be more competitive. Yeah, I think and you're so, hitting for me, you're hitting the kind of the nail on the head in terms of these questions. But the two the two that I find really critical at the beginning of an engagement or at the beginning of speaking with someone. And one is, yes, yeah, as a question, do you really want to grow? I mean, what the, the, is the growth outcome desirable to you, you know, personally and as a company? Because I think a lot of times, you know, people kind of get caught up in, yeah, I want to grow, I want to get big. But when you actually start looking at, OK, well, that's what this is going to look like. You're going to have this many people. You're going to be operating these kind of services. You're going to be have this kind of scale. You know, do you really want that is is a question that you really need to kind of sit on and answer, you know, really definitively before you engage it. And then the question is, is, well, now are you willing to do what needs to be done to get there? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they want the outcome. <laughs> but, you know, the decision, like you said, you know, you had to make some tough decisions about lopping off services, tough decisions about taking on investment, getting that capital to fuel the growth. And those aren't easy. Um, and, and sometimes as much as you want the outcome, people are not willing to do the work. But if you can get those two pieces, at least mm -hmm. we've got a fighting chance to, to do that. And I think that's really key to ask those. Yeah. So bringing that down from once you answer those questions, the sales tactical kinds yeah. of things, it's asking who here can sell, who here will sell, where's the untapped opportunity to activate people's you know, potential for growth in selling that I, I don't even know where that is. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself, what are the areas that if I pulled the levers would actually help us grow more? Mm -hmm. Do we need to pull in more new logos? So I'm going to need some kind of prospecting or you know, whether it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then that's very different local than say national and international. I'll leave off all the marketing stuff and the operations stuff, but just, just from a selling perspective, yeah. well, maybe it's our accounts. Do we have opportunity to grow in our accounts? Well, how do we do that? And how do we take proactive action to grow them? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's actually, we're just, we have plenty of inbounds and uh, enough outbounds, but our win rate isn't high yeah, enough. Exactly. Those conversations aren't strong enough. When we see a big opportunity, we don't know how to strategize to really pull that in because we're coming in second place too often. So you have to find where the, critical areas to say, if we improve this metric, if we improve this area, that's 10% growth right there. There's 20% growth right there. And yeah. then to actually do it. I, think I, like, thing I like that whole kind of, it really is looking at it as a process and saying, hey, it may not just be about putting more into the top of the funnel. We mm -hmm. may have stages of the funnel that we need to figure out either how do we filter better? How do we convert better? Are we actually moving the right deals mm -hmm. you know, through the process? Should we be pulling deals out sooner that aren't really you know, a target for us, qualified <laughs> for us? And I, I think that's smart. It's really kind of taking taking a step back and kind of looking at the process that you have, and then yeah, figuring figuring out where those those points are that I can actually actually impact in some meaningful way. Yeah, and yeah. I'll, I'll I'll leave you with one more point that I think is really important for service businesses. When the service providers themselves, when they change their mind and say, "I'm really going to do this," in some ways, teaching them to be like an entrepreneur versus like an employee where they say, here's my growth strategy, here's my practice growth strategy, here's my sales plan, here's why I'm doing this, and here's my own plan to be motivated to actually sell, to find the time yeah. to sell, to not have the excuse of, oh, I got too busy, and to do it over a consistent period with, and this is one of the biggest challenges we're seeing over the last just five or 10 years, distraction, the world of distraction. I mean, everyone thought they were distracted 10 years ago. Now we have the world at our fingertips distraction in, in our phones all the time. Yep. The social scientists at the phone companies and the messaging <laughs> companies, the social media companies have their little hooks in our brains. Yeah. And I literally, it's weird. I just had a lunch where I talked to the person for an hour and a half. It's like, I haven't looked at my phone for an hour and a half. <laughs> and we didn't have that. People's ability to tune out distractions and their ability to concentrate and get in the yeah. zone is me off. And this is absolutely necessary to succeed at selling. So we have a client where the skills we'd worked on, that wasn't the issue. They weren't doing it. So we came back and we said, let's do our extreme sales productivity challenge. Yeah. And we put them through the program to figure out how to, what was most important, what were they going to do? How are they going to find this time? And then we gave, put in accountability systems over 90 days and it was massive. It was like a 16 times return. Yeah. We did it with, a, we did it with a, a telecom company where it wasn't a service company, but we put several hundred people through it. It generated $100 million in pipeline. It wasn't even a skill program. So, yeah, no, I, it, and it's funny. I laugh. 
the ability to be productive and to change when people go from this reactive to proactive, they need new tools now to be able to do it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, the, the whole um, productivity, like how do you really assess all the things that you're doing on a day to day, week to week basis and tease out from there the things that are, are really high, highly productive and those things that are not. And oftentimes that's not an obvious analysis. Uh, mm -hmm. And then figuring out the strategies of how do I reprioritize and how do I how do I put in place structure? Because I think that so much of it is not just sort of motivation. I mean, yes, you need to be motivated and you need to be clear on what your mm -hmm. what your priorities need to be. But if you don't have the calendar structure, or the the technical structure to manage the incoming distractions that you have coming at you, you're not you're not going to win. You're just it's, it's a like you said that the, the the companies have mastered the art of 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 getting our brains fixated on dopamine. <laughs> we don't if we don't have um, processes in place, rhythms, disciplines in place to be able to do that. Uh, it's hard. I, working with leadership teams, one of the first things we're doing is looking at what are the two hours you're going to spend every week focusing on strategic work. And if we can't get that in place, I'm kind of like, there's no point. There's no point in doing all the other work if you're not going to be able to find those two hours a week. Indeed. Indeed. So that's what we did for ourselves for growth, too, because in in 2011, we literally changed our focus, changed our name, started from scratch, locked off two thirds of our services and said, if we don't have a good plan to actually make this go, it's going to go nowhere. And yeah. so we spent five years executing a five-year plan, and we just came up with our new five-year plan. And it's a huge part of it was developing that, that infrastructure to be able to scale. And then for the last two years, it's been about finding people to sell, yeah. and finding people to grow practices, and giving them something where they say, oh, what we didn't want is them to say, well, I could just do this on my own. They could say, I could work on my own for three years and invest millions of dollars and still not have what you have. And I could sell sales training for myself and I could be doing 20,000 here and 50,000 there, but I can't sell million dollar clients. But if I work with you, I can sell million dollar clients and I have all of the stuff that I don't have to worry about. I can just, you know, we need people that can deliver, but it's just a lot of people just want to sell and deliver. They don't want to do the rest of it. So we had to create this to be really attractive to people to sell. And now we're just trying to trying to find the right fits of people that yeah. see that vision. But that was all the service business growth strategy. And for us, once again, it's all about selling and client growth. Yeah. I'm curious. So you, you mentioned that you, you lopped off a couple of services that you were offering mm -hmm. at the time. And I, I think one of the one of my kind of tenants is that and if you want to scale and if you want to scale quickly, you have to focus. You have to actually do offer less, offer fewer things. Mm -hmm. how, how did you actually decide what to I mean, I guess what were you dealing with or what were the ones you, you decided mm -hmm. to, to lop off and how did you make that decision? What, what did that look like? Yeah, sure. Um, I mentioned that we were doing sales and marketing for service businesses. So our our revenue was probably 40% marketing, 30% strategy, 35%, and then the rest was sales training, all this business development stuff. So this was 2011. We we actually were on the Inc. Magazine's list of the fastest growing companies in the country in 2008. We were cruising along. We hit the recession. We actually held together okay. We didn't grow during that time, but we also didn't shrink. Yeah. Our revenue stayed about the same. And then around 2010, we said, all right, it's time to go from playing defense to playing offense. And we said, how do we double our business in size and double it again? Mm -hmm. And we said, can we be great at all three of these things? No. And also, is our market big enough to sustain a larger business? And we said, well, I don't necessarily think so. We might want to leave just focusing on service businesses because yeah. we wanted a globally scaled company. So we said, what are we really great at? Uh, and what are the kind of business we know how to manage? And if we set a goal to say, and I know this is going to sound, you know, cliche and pat yourself on the back, to be number one in the industry, yeah. what would it look like to actually be not just a nice little growing service businesses in the sea of service businesses, but to be, you know, a global leader in something? And we said, in the area of marketing, mm -hmm. that's changing like crazy, and all of the different things we need to do, like lead generation and inbound marketing and. It's like, all right, if, if we wanted to do that, we would have to change a lot yep. to be able to be great. And we need more scale. If we wanted to do strategy, we would have to drop both of those things and do more like strategy consulting and actually build the, the infrastructure for that instead of just four or five smart guys that know the industry. We had to build that. And we said, well, that's not necessarily where we want to go, but our backgrounds were at training companies. My business partner was at the American Management Association mm -hmm. on the executive team there. He was the president of Management Center Europe, and I had done the same. At another company, I was running 200 public seminars a year and 400 in-house programs. So we said, all right, the sales training and the executive education side is 
what we know best from a growth perspective. Yeah. So it was our smallest area. So we locked them off and we said, we're going to do less and obsess about having the best offerings mm-hmm. and best growth structure. So a lot of service businesses actually do have great offerings and the thing in, in their way is their own organizational construct. We didn't want our organizational construct to get in the way. We wanted our organizational construct to help us grow. Yeah. And that's where we are now. Yeah. I like that. The whole you know, understanding that strategy is is a function of not only you, but the market and the competitors that you're going to play against and figuring out what is that right choice in that. Because I think a lot of people go out, they get very kind of, uh, you know, internally focused and what do we grade out? What do we really want to do? But they fail to really look at where are the market opportunities. But I think that that is a good story for really pointing that out. So then I had another question on the, you mentioned one of the things that you're doing is how do you find more salespeople? How do you actually find salespeople either, either internally when you're going into a service-based business and and, mm-hmm. you know, seeing that you've got this, you know, concentration of senior sellers and you're looking at trying to expand that to other people inside the company. How do you identify people who are going to be good in that role? Is there any tricks or secrets that you have? Yeah. So I used to work with this grizzled old consultant in HR and I asked him, we were going fly fishing one day. I said, after 25 years in the industry, what's what's still the hardest thing for you to do? And he said, Probably the hardest thing is when you're interviewing someone, especially for a senior position, is to figure out and sort out the real deal from the articulate phonies. And that is even harder in selling. It's a lot of times you find out that they suck. You find out in about six months. <laughs> almost nothing that you can do in the interview process to sort that out. Yeah. You can, however, get better. We use psychographic assessments. Okay to help us find the right person. Let me actually step back and say the biggest problem I think in service businesses when they hire sales is they don't know exactly what they want them to do. They just bring in someone with the Rolodex. That's usually strike one, strike two. You have to be very careful about what you want them to do, what the expectations are. And then you have to ask yourself for these expectations. Is this how it's really going to work? Especially going into service business, they'll say, all right, we're going to hire the business development person to set meetings for senior people, say, because if we can get in front of people, we can close them. And we're going to pay them $40,000 a year, a couple of years out of college or right out of college or 50000 some low amount. And, you know, if they can generate 10 meetings a week, that's, you know, meetings for it's like, are you crazy? You think it's that easy to generate 10 meetings a week? You are bananas like <laughs> other planet bananas for what you're selling. Like this is a spreadsheet fantasy. You might as well stick a unicorn on it. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, but, you know. And then they, 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 they switch over and they hire a senior person. Well, we get a guy that's been, you know, 10 years in the industry and he's got a Rolodex, blah, blah, blah. They pay him 125000 They say, you know what, let's get two in case one fail. Then they both fail, so they end up wasting $250,000. They just, yeah. you know, they have to know what they want them to do. Um, they're not rigorous enough in the interview process. They don't do things like really digging in mm-hmm. and, and digging in. They just get happy years because they see dollar signs. They think it's going to be easy. It's yeah. not the hardest thing you're going to end up doing. Yeah, I always find that. I mean, interviewing is tough anyway. I mean, again, hiring anybody, it's it's easy. It's easy to see what you want to see. It's tough to ask tough questions. But I think sales is even more so just because you're dealing typically you're dealing with people who can be per, very persuasive. And, and ironically, just because they can be very good at selling you an interview doesn't mean they're going to be really good at selling your products and services. So yeah, a lot uh, of them are. Yeah. Yeah. So I would love to kind of hear. So if someone wants to find out more information about you, about the book, about services, What's the best way to get a hold of you or what are some resources that they can they can use to learn some of that? Well, the easiest way is just to go to raingroup.com or you can find me on LinkedIn, Mike Schultz, Mike Schultz 500, uh, I think is what it is. But just going to raingroup.com or Googling Mike Schultz Rain Group and you'll find you'll find more than you could ever, ever want to read. For anyone who we actually also run the Rain Group Center for Sales Research for anyone that wants to reach out and get access to the research, you can just send me an email or go to the website emails. M. Schultz, M. S. C. H. U. L. T. Z. at raingroup.com. And to find the books, you can find them on the website. You can find them on Amazon. You can also find the one you didn't mention, which is professional services marketing, which is all okay. the way back from the days when we used to focus on services. So yeah. books, books are easy to find too. I will I will make sure all of that is in the show notes here so people can find the links and find the titles. Mike, this has been a pleasure. I hope we can, hope we can find another subject. We can do this again sometime, but uh, it was absolutely fun to have you on here and I appreciate your time. Well, it was great having you and thanks for doing this. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeld. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, 
visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com newsletter.